Hey, Dr. Alan Christensen here. I want to take a deep dive into nightshades and talk about these. Are these dangerous? Are these helpful? Where do they fall on that? So for openers, what's your experience been with nightshades? For some of you, you've cut them out and found that to be a relevant part of your autoimmune recovery. Awesome, I salute you. You know, any way you can help to sort out food and how it works with your body and how that can improve your health is completely commendable. So keep up the great work. Now, many are thinking, do I have to stay off them forever? Are these bad foods? And then there's a larger audience that asks me, is there something to this? Are these foods inherently dangerous? Are there some people that have had just odd, unpredictable reactions? Or is there just obvious smoking gun evidence that these are bad things we all need to avoid? And I want to really go deep in this and talk about the science behind it, what we know about these plants and what the data shows us. So let's make some, get some good orientations for starters. So what are the nightshades? Well, these are some plants that uh, the non, there are some food versions and non-food food versions of these. These are also called Solanaceae plants. And we've got a lot of members in this family, things like potatoes, eggplant, tomatoes, peppers, but also non-food things like tobacco, belladonna, jimson weed, datura. Uh, and of these, some of them have some very dark berries. And especially the non-food ones, like the last few I mentioned, the belladonna, the jimson weed, the datura, they're known to be toxins and <laughs> no, no bones about it. They will kill you if you consume a lot of them. And people have known that for a long time. You know, humans have always tried to figure out what you can eat and pushing that envelope. And so we've known that things like that jimson weed with that pretty trumpet plant, you just don't eat those leaves or you will not survive and probably have a pretty odd ride along the way. I won't go into that, but that's where the nightshade came from. And it sounds ominous, and it was meant to, because it was known that many things, that these things are dangerous and overtly poisonous. So what does it mean to say they're poisonous? Well, these are plants that are especially high in alkaloids. And alkaloids are plant metabolites, which are just very active chemicals in humans or animals, even at small concentrations. So nightshades have got a couple different kinds of alkaloids. And some of these are thought to be relevant to health, and some of these are really not thought to be concerns. So the tropanes, for example, these are found in many nightshade-type plants, not in the food-type nightshade plants. These are very strong, called anticholinergics. And these have been made into drugs that can be useful to reverse poisoning from pesticides or biological weapons, but they can really activate, overly so, the parasympathetic nervous system in high amounts. I talked about the plant belladonna. Uh, in Middle Ages, if you were a woman of higher status and you were going out for an evening, it was known that if your pupils were dilated, you would look more attractive. And part of getting all, all gussied up to look pretty was using some drops to dilate your pupils. And that came from a plant called belladonna, which apparently means beautiful woman. And it was known that that was why it was done. <laughs> and they work to activate the parasympathetic nervous system. And in the eye drops, you know, relatively harmless, but in high amounts, pretty dangerous. So those are one group of alkaloids. They're not found in the food type Solanaceae plants, just in some of the medicinal herbal toxic ones. Another big alkaloid we've got in these plants is nicotine, which is found in tobacco. Now, it's also found in eggplant, believe it or not. But the amounts are so crazy small, you would literally need thousands and thousands of eggplant to get the, the amount of just like even a few milligrams of nicotine. So not enough to be relevant, but technically it is there. Nicotine's an insecticide that plants make to kill insects and ward off a lot of things that would destroy them. Not found in other food like nightshades. So we don't have nicotine in potatoes. <laughs> no one smokes potatoes. We don't have nicotine in tomatoes or eggplant. It's not there. Another big one is capsaicin. And pretty much all things heat and spicy they come back to capsaicin. Now, this stuff, I've never really heard it being misaligned, apart from just like, wow, that was too hot for me. The data is really strong that capsaicin and spicy things are good. They do a nice job at killing low-grade infections. They boost metabolism. They help our immune system. They reverse leaky gut. They raise secretory IgA. So no real fears, no debates about capsaicin. We find that in the pepper version of nightshades, not so much in other food likes. So then we come down to solanine, and really all the concerns about nightshade food plants and their alkaloids all evolve around this alkaloid solanine. That's like the sole smoking gun culprit. We find this in white potatoes, not sweet potatoes. They're not nightshade plants at all. We also find this in eggplant. We've got some in paprika, some in peppers, some in goji berries. 
summon tomatillos. Now, there was a really big nightshade that's talked about a lot that actually didn't make that list. <laughs> and that's tomatoes. So tomatoes are often categorized as nightshades, they are, but they do not contain solanine. It was thought that they did, and there was thought that tomato leaves, for example, could have a toxic effect like potato leaves. So we'll go more into the chemistry of solanine, but tomatoes are excluded from that. There's a whole different compound called tomatine that tomatoes have. They don't have solanine. That's a rather recent discovery. And tomatine, the toxicity of it, it's non-existent. Tomatine is something that's not, not toxic, not harmful. And actually, tomato leaves are used in culinary purposes, on purpose. So tomatoes are not in this nightshade plant list that are harmful with solanine. They've got no toxic, harmful alkaloids. They do contain lectins. I've talked about that in other episodes, but no alkaloid, uh, nightshade alkaloid compounds to be concerned about. So potatoes, uh, eggplant, those both do contain solanine. Those are two relevant versions of this. Also not found in active amounts in other nightshade plants. So the peppers, the goji berries, not substantial, uh, possibly present, but so minuscule. And we'll get into real exacting information on amounts and quantities of solanine. So really, it comes down to potatoes and eggplant <laughs> as far as possible issues and solanine. Now, the solanine is something that is associated with chlorophyll production. So the more green something is, the more you can have solanine in it. And potato leaves are probably the worst offender we could find here. Potato leaves, they're green, they've got chlorophyll, they've got a fair amount of solanine. And you could harm yourself on even a small number of these things. Also, we'll find this in, so some types of eggplant will make it, the more common European eggplant. The Chinese Asian eggplant does not. So the long, thin, purpley ones, as opposed to the shorter, fatter, darker, brownish purple ones. And if you look, the brownish purple ones, the more standard European eggplant, below the skin, there's some greenishness there. That's where you would find the solanine. So too with potatoes. Now potatoes, when they're really old, they get green and they sprout. In those cases, they can have solanine and they can have amounts that could be a concern. You could, in theory, take some green, sprouted, nasty potatoes and consume about four, four to six pounds of them raw and you could get a dangerous dose of solanine. No debate about that. Now, here's another really odd wrinkle about solanine. There's a lot of foods that are night, not nightshades that also have solanine. So if you really were concerned about this as a toxic alkaloid, we've got to cast a broader net. And that includes a lot of foods that I don't really hear anyone being concerned about. Um, apples, blueberries, cherries, beets, uh, okra, artichokes, huckleberries. These are not foods I've heard on the do not fly list. <laughs> but by the logic of nightshade alkaloids, the toxic ones being bad, these foods should be red flags also. And if someone seems to have an issue with nightshades but does okay with blueberries or beets, I would question the reaction and question if that were a significant thing. So the first concept about solanine was arthritis. And this was speculated about, and it's been studied in pretty good detail. To date, no, no studied research, no, no published research has really linked solanine to arthritis. There's been no causative factors. Solanine is actually badly absorbed. You can't absorb it very effectively. And most of it gets hydrolyzed and broken down by the intestinal tract. So this is the thing to where the dose-related effects are pretty different. You know, a little bit of it, even a moderate amount of it, none really enters your bloodstream. There is a point at where the mega doses, like you could get from potato leaves, like mon a huge, huge pile of potato leaves, could that much can bypass some of these protective mechanisms, and now a bunch of it can get in the bloodstream. Totally valid concern, don't eat potato leaves. <laughs> so where is this found in plant parts? Well, in terms of the skin and the flesh of potatoes and sprouted potatoes, we can find it measurable in sprouted potatoes. We can find amounts that can, can be significant. And I mentioned a few pounds can be a bad thing. In terms of potato flesh, not detectable. There's alpha-solanine and alpha-chalcanine, which is related alkaloid. Both of those are non-detectable in potato flesh based upon a lot of assays. And this is true for new potatoes, russet potatoes, yellow skin potatoes, different versions of that, uh, not detectable in the flesh. 
It can be present in the peel in some pretty tiny quantities, but the sprouts, it's present in higher quantities more, that are more significant. So potato sprouts, please do avoid those. <laughs> and potato leaves, you know, not, not so much good things. And these come under the category of plant toxins or phytotoxins. And phytotoxins really engender discussion about the idea of hormesis. So the funny thing is that these plant toxins are in categories that are also called phytonutrients. Uh, we see a huge number of different chemicals that are found in, in plant foods. And many of these are known to have health beneficial effects. So what we'll see is that compounds like polyphenols, for example, those are, those are phytotoxins. Those are also called phytonutrients. And what hormesis is describing is that the effect that these have is completely different per the dosage. You know, the difference between um, a poison and a medicine is just the quantity. There's a story about just water. You know, you can drink too much water and you can dilute your electrolytes so badly, your heart can stop. And these phytochemicals, these different ones that we'll see, they're just like that. So a little tiny bit of them seems to be really good. So this is true for phenolics, like phenolic acids. This is true for glycoalkaloids, which includes the category of nightshades. This is true for carotenoids. So where do we find phenolic acids? Well, apples, potatoes, grape seeds, oats, coffee, kiwi, cinnamon, plums, cherries, and then flavonoids. We get these from onions, bananas, garbanzos, chili peppers, lemons, strawberries, cabbage, and then carotenoids, carrots, cantaloupe, kale, all kinds of good foods. So all of these are phytotoxins that are chemically associated and related to alkaloids found from nightshades. They're in these same chemical classification categories. And they're all toxins. <laughs> Meaning if you get a lot of them <clears throat> just like straight into your bloodstream, they would be harmful for you. But the minuscule amount we get in plants seems to actually be helpful. And not so much because they support our chemical pathways, but because they, they irritate our chemical pathways. They stress our bodies. They challenge our bodies to react and do a better job at detoxifying. In fact, some more classic examples of these would include the isothiocyanates in cruciferous vegetables and broccoli. So big idea about nightshades, alkaloids, solanine, and these are part of this broader category of phytonutrients or plant compounds. Now, oddly enough, there have been some studies, if you look at solanine and solanine's effects upon the immune system, its effects upon the body overall, there's not been big human studies. There have been some lower level animal and test tube studies, and they've actually been positive. They've argued that solanine in test tubes can have very strong effects against cancer cells and promoting better immune function. And when you think about the context of phytonutrients in which these things are found, you know, that's plausible because all these other phytonutrients that are associated, they've been borne out by larger studies to do really good things as well. So if nightshades have seemed to have hurt you and you've stopped them and gotten better, awesome. You may reconsider, you may reintroduce them. To the rest of you who wants to know if you've got to avoid nightshades on principle, I would say not unless you also want to cut out other things that contain solanine, like beets, blueberries, apples, and also unless you want to cut out the whole other category of phytotoxins, like broccoli and tea and all these other things that have been shown to help us a lot. So, Dr. Christensen here with you. Take wonderful care. We'll talk in really soon. Bye-bye.